Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on MovieHouseMemories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. You're listening to Lunchtime Movie Review from LunchtimeMovieReview.com. And we are the children of the 80s. The children of the '80s are back with another review of one of our one of our childhood favorites. I'm Patrick. I'm Jason, and I'm Greg. <laughs> and this week we're reviewing one of Jason's all-time favorite films of the 1980s, 1980s Midnight Madness. And before we get into our review of that classic film, first a word from our sponsor. It's always 24/7 fun at Pinball City. The newly renovated Pinball City features two Starfire machines and background checks on all employees, making it the safest place for the entire family. Say the secret word, faggot beefy, and get one free play on either Starfire or Madame Leona machine. Pinball City is located between Big M Miniature Golf and Johnny's Fat Boy Burgers. Stay out of the melons at Pinball City. <laughs> okay. Well, that ad pretty much summarized the movie. So I yeah, think yeah, that's, that's that, that. You got it right there. That's that. That was the highlight of the film. I mean, pinball and peewee. What else do you need? So, all right, and Jason, your pick. Your uh, I assume you have a winning summary for us. I do. My summary is pretty short for this one because I don't want to spoil anything for those <laughs> who haven't seen it. But it basically features a, a game master named Leon, who's sort of a uh, modern day, well, I, I would say geek, um, but he puts together a competition which he calls the Great All Nighter, and he selects uh, what he calls cliques from the local college. Now the cliques are pretty cookie cutter. You have the nerds, uh, some feminists, some jocks, uh, some rich uh, bad kids or bad boys, and then you have. David Naughton's group, uh, which is the yellow team, he color coordinates his teams, but the yellow team, who's just kind of like the leftovers, but you're going to see them, they're more like the Jesus characters. They have nothing to really learn throughout the film except for David Naughton, and Leon uh, invites them all to participate in the game. Initially, all the cliques are very resistant, uh, but, but because of the bad blood between all of the cliques and... Um, this goes from just kind of basically the jocks going in and harassing all of the other cliques that they all decide to play his game. And the game is a scavenger hunt through Los Angeles. So it starts with a clue. Uh, the clue is usually a riddle. They have to solve the riddle, and the, the answer to the riddle sends them to a specific location where they end up finding the next clue and going to another location. So it's all pre-Amazing Race, but it's basically like the Amazing Race, except all in Los Angeles. And then the first person, first group to the finish line uh, gets to gets a little pro, uh, trophy, a little plaque, and uh, they become uh, the best click on campus. So in a nutshell, that is uh, Midnight Madness. It's... It was done by Disney. It's the first Disney film distributed by Buena Vista Pictures. And Disney actually greenlit it uh, because they wanted to make their own version of Animal House. Uh, but because Midnight Madness has some sexual suggestions, it was going to be PG and not G. So they couldn't uh, market it or distribute it under uh, the Disney name. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I got some numbers on Midnight Madness released on February 8th, 1980, the same day as Hero at Large with John Ritter and The Last Married Couple in America with George Siegel. And just tell me what you want with Ali McGraw. So uh, obviously it was probably the number one movie that week. <laughs> and, and notice it's go ahead, Greg. Yeah, I was about to say the best movies always come out in February. Of course. I was going to say that this laid the groundwork for Black Panther. And there you go. <laughs> Because uh, if there's a film that really represents Black History Month, it's Midnight Madness. Uh, so, it has a black guy in it. Yeah. <laughs> so, it was released the same month as The Fog, American Gigolo, Saturn 3, Fatso, and Jason's all-time favorite film, Cruising. 
Uh, grossed. Oh, cruising is <laughs> awful. Grossed uh, almost three million dollars uh, was the 97th highest grossing film of 1980. That's 97 out of 116. It was right behind such classics as When Time Ran Out, Heaven's Gate, Folks with uh, Roger Moore, and right in front of Loving Couples, The Idolmaker, and The Black Marble. Uh, it was the second PG film released by Disney, the first being Black Hole in 1979. Uh, mm. After its release, Disney didn't associate with the film until 2004. Uh, it was actually released by other release uh, companies uh, when it came out on video and dvd and in 2004 they finally released it under the disney brand and oh, okay but let let me ask you the the black hole was released by disney correct midnight a, madness was by buena vista cr- cr- well yeah made by it's buena vista stru- uh, structure but it was a second pg film so, yes. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, right. Buena Vista released uh, at Midnight Madness, but it was the PG aspect of it. So you're not you're we're, you and I are both right. We're not wrong. Yes. So. No. 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 I just want to clarify that Midnight Madness was never Disney didn't promote it with the Disney name, Correct. so it wasn't like Disney's Midnight Madness. Correct. They were behind the film. They just didn't want to be associated with it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Not a reflection on the quality of the film in any way. No, it's like visiting a good whore. <laughs> you don't want to admit that you're going to a prostitute, but you have a good time when you're there. All right. I, is, so I heard. So, and it, the film actually inspired actual real games similar to the ones played in the film and they go on to this day. And Rotten Tomatoes has this at nothing for critics because there's no critical reviews of it and 70% audience, which is a shocker to me. So... That's the number. Why do you think it's a shocker? It says it's a fun movie. Uh, okay, well, we'll start with right. that. Start there. Why Midnight Madness? Because I assumed that because you grew up in Los Angeles, that because this skirts around all over Los Angeles to real life locations, that that is why you really like this film, because it was shot in basically your neighborhood. I, I think not all the locations that are done in the film, I don't think exist. I don't know where the Paps Blue Ribbon a brewery is in Los Angeles. I know they have beer breweries, but I don't think Paps is one of them. Johnny's Fat Boy Burger is actually Johnny's Boiler, so they just changed the name. They use a real restaurant location in Los Angeles for that. Obviously, the Griffith Observatory is real. The Bonaventure Hotel uh, at the climax of the film, the finish line, is real. I don't think that the piano museum is real. The Big M Miniature Golf, I imagine, may be real. i just never seen a Big M Miniature Golf uh, anywhere in Pinball City. It's obviously just a generic arcade. But I believe the arcade was an actual arcade that they shot in. Uh, they changed the names of a lot of locations, but uh, that was kind of the research I did. And there wasn't a lot to look up on this film, but it was uh, th- that they they you know went around and shot at night uh, for most of the locations at actual physical locations. There wasn't much. There was something that was shot at uh, like the Disney building. And I don't know, I don't know which one that was, if it was some of the interiors for the hotel or if it was uh, actual, but they actually shot it on the lot. Not, I, I, I know they use a lot of the hotel, uh, at least the lobby area. I mean, that's the real lobby. Sometimes when you're seeing them run up the stairs, these concrete, uh, circular, uh, circular, uh, staircases, that's the real hotel. The elevators are real. I've never been in the room at the Bonaventure Hotel. I can't imagine they're going to allow Disney to squirt water all down this hallway. So I imagine that's the sound studio. But also with that piano museum, I I imagine that's just uh, not a real thing. But no, uh, Patrick, to answer your question, it's just not my growing up in L.A. and – and liking this film, I actually do appreciate the story and and the characters. I know they're cheesy. I think the jokes are cheesy, but they still make me smile and 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 laugh at some points. Emilio um, and his relationship uh, with Stephen Faust, uh, just always kind of goading him and poking him in the side. That that to me is really funny. I I, I still appreciate it. Greg, had, had it has you... it has flounder. <laughs> yeah, right. It has flounder. Exactly. And of course, I, you know, we probably know about this movie still because Michael J. Fox. This was like his first film, right? 
Yeah. As, as far as my knowledge, it is. And in, in it, and this is has, this is a little bit before Family Ties, I, I would think. Even oh yeah, this is about I think three or four years before Family Ties. It's before his first. I, I always thought his first film role was Class of 1984, but this is actually his first film role. Yeah, it says that on the DVD box. Like if you track down the DVD, it will say, you know, Michael J. Fox's first film. In the credits, he's just known as Michael Fox. The <laughs> J's not even there yet. Yeah, and he's <laughs> he's actually the age that Alex P. Keaton is supposed to be. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't have a lot of range in this film. They just no, <laughs> but no character really does. Right, right. They're pretty much stock characters, and uh, there's not much you can do with those. <laughs> No, and, and I mean, there's some funny moments, right? Yeah. Like right now, if you make, if you remade this movie now, people would have problems with some scenes. Obviously, Flounder pushing his girlfriend or hitting her with a pie in the face and pushing her with a fountain at the end of the film uh, wouldn't be very Disney because it's violence against women. What's his name? Uh, Flinch in the beginning when his uh, mom sets him up on the date and they open the door and there's this ugly girl standing there. And so David Naughton says, oh, Flinch, you can't go out with her. You have to come with me and play this game. And they just kind of abandon her. <laughs> you know, so uh, stuff like that is uh, is pretty dated. But it's still I again, I, I, I just really enjoy the characters. Some of the shots are pretty funny, too. Every time they show David Naughton's love interest, she's always in this like soft filter on the yes. lens. <laughs> And it's just – it's hilarious because any time they show her throughout the entire film, they use that soft lens, and they don't use it on anyone else. Yeah, you're, you're just waiting for the heart music. Right. It always looks like she's about to, you know, and erupt. It, and, and it's funny. Like, I don't know why she likes David Naughton so much because he's kind of a jerk to his brother, and he really wants to win. So we never see why she likes him so much, but I don't know. She does. The heart wants what it wants. Yeah. <laughs> It might be through the camera or the light that she's seeing him and the entire time. It's just. <laughs> yeah. But some of the other things are really funny. Like, or maybe it's cocaine. <laughs> right. So, Greg, you mentioned that Michael J. Fox is the age Michael P. Keaton. I'm so, uh, I'm sorry, Alex, Michael, yeah. Alex, Alex P. Keaton, Keaton should have been in Family Ties. Right, right. Every character is supposed to be in college in this film, and most of them look like they're 40 years old. <laughs> like true. all the jocks. The yeah. jocks are, are literally balding. Yes. yes. Like Blaylock is balding and he looks 40, 45 years old, but still fun. <laughs> and, and then you've got what's his name from Greece and Greece to the Eugene the, Eugene. Uh, Isn't his name Eugene in everything? I believe so. so. <laughs> yeah. But your typical so. nerd, right? Yeah. He's king of the nerds. And I love that. The nerds end up with the feminists like they they have this joint alliance at one point. But they all signed up. They all seem to hook up. And that that to me is really funny and sort of heartwarming <laughs> in a way. I know it's cheesy, but I, I really enjoy that. I love that there's fake Hare Krishnas at the L.A. airport handing out flyers and yes. everyone wants to beat them up or run yes. past them. It's just it's it's just a fun movie for me to sit through. Well, and it's a film that like just revels in the stereotypes that the leader of the feminist group is like very very angry, very very angry all the time, uh, you know, at everyone but prim pr primarily men that she feels. Oh you know. right, <laughs> and when they have fat characters in it, every fat character in this movie just wants to eat. <laughs> yes. Like they are explaining why these characters are fat, not genetics. Nope. It's all lifestyle. You have the two fat twins and I don't know if they've ever been in anything else, uh, but they run off into the carnival. They eat uh, everything. And then, and then uh, yeah. And then Harold Flounder, Flounder. Yeah. yeah Harold uh, wants to eat, you know, Oreos and, and marshmallows. And his girlfriend doesn't want him to eat any right. of those things, so he hides things. I just love that. And he, and he gorges himself at the end there of the, the movie. Oh, right. Yeah, and she wants her fat little Harold, but she doesn't want him to eat. <laughs> right. The, the twins were in the Gong Show movie and ha Hamburger the movie. Uh, oh, I wonder what they did in Hamburger the movie. <laughs> 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 the other thing we should mention is – there is sort of a racial stereotype with Blade 
uh, who's the only, it looks like Hispanic in the film, but he carries a switchblade <laughs> and never talks. Yeah. That's right, and he's the one that doesn't get through the metal detector. Right. He's the one who doesn't get through the metal detector. Even, even the, the black, se- black security at LAX back in those days. And the only time you see him smile, I believe, is when Harold assaults his girlfriend. <laughs> so there's – okay, there's stuff that's not politically correct. Uh, but still, Blade's a great character. Yeah. And, yeah. and Emilio has a lot of range. Emilio could be funny at times. He could be scary when they kidnap Scott. And for Scott to tell him where the finish line is. Which was kind of weird because Scott is like very much like, hey, over here, I'll give you information. And then suddenly is like, why would I give you that? And has to be threatened for it. It's like, are you going to give up your brother or not? You know, like you seem to be wanting to get some revenge. And what about the old people watching at back at uh, Leon's place throughout the entire oh, film? Oh, yeah. Piglet? I, With Piglet? Yeah. It yeah, is that Pig- the actual voice of Piglet shows you the connection with uh, Disney. the Disney films. Yeah, and uh, the the mean landlady, uh, she's been in a number of like television shows from the eighties. If you watch any old mm-hmm. shows, like you know the A teams and stuff like that, she'll pop up in it. But I, I like that part too. And and his what I don't understand is his big uh, game board. <laughs> so he has all these uh, vehicles, and they're already the vehicles the teams are going to use, although Leon had no – there's no way Leon would know that they're going to use these particular vehicles, but somehow he knows. So he has right. his vehicles up on the board, and then when he was like, let's see if they got the first clue, the things would light up in little arrows, and then the uh, Griffith Observatory would light up, and he'd move all the vehicles there. So it really wasn't – uh, it seemed like a lot of like uh, build up for little payoff. Like if you're going to have this big strategy board, wouldn't you want to show the vehicles re- in real time at what location they are? But he doesn't. Leon just puts them on the first clue, and then if they ever get to the second clue, he puts them there. He never puts them like far off on this map at any time. Right, right. I will say this: that uh, speaking of Leon, uh, if I ever came into fu money. I think I'd want to be like Leon in oh. in the case of having my candy and sunshine to just <laughs> stroll around on roller skates and fetch me things. A very weird point, right? <clears throat> it looked like they lived with Leon. Yes. So it was like a three's company situation. Yes. But it looked more like instead of a Janet and Chrissy just needing rent money, that they were actually yes. they looked like sexually interested in Leon. Yes. And if they ever make a part two, I swear it should be <laughs> NC-17 or X. Cause if they make I, a part two. But, I, but that's how the if, – if memory serves me, that's how the, the movie opens, right, with them roller skating the in, invitations, if you yeah. will. Right, with the Midnight Madness the theme song, right? Yeah, with right. Oh, yeah that's yeah. – uh, that's, uh, Starts to get to you no matter what you do, you're going to play. Yeah. That's an awesome song, and they're on roller skates, and it just sets the tone for the movie that, you know, sit down, you're in for a, uh, a an adventure for the next hour and a half. <laughs> you're, I, in, you're in for something for an hour and 52 <laughs> minutes. The opening shot of the movie, it, it sets the tone. You know that this isn't going to be a great movie. Right. And, and you know it's in Southern California. Yes. Yeah, and, and so this is a movie that's not going to take a left turn – on you or talk about something get very preachy or political about it from scene one you just go okay i'm in i got it i like it no no (laughs) not at all i i i was thinking when you mentioned the amazing race that's what i was thinking too i also the movie was a little reminiscent to me and this is one that i don't know if either of you have seen this Uh, it's an old one uh it's a mad 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 world Oh, yeah. It's one of my wife's favorite films of all time. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, it, you know, it's like a, it's like the, the budget version. Of, yeah. This is like mad, the mad, CBS mad, TV mad. movie of the week version of that film. <laughs> so. Right. But it has that same, you know, I, that, I, think, I, think they, I think they drew some inspiration from It's a Mad, 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 Mad World, including perhaps Leon's map that you were yeah. talking about earlier. Right. The Spencer Tracy character in the... And the it's a mad, mad, mad world has one of those and is following the various people that are trying to find the, 
the treasure, the buried treasure, and so forth, plotting where they are. So Well, and Jason's talked about this film for years, and I was talking to him before Greg joined the call, and, and we didn't talk about this on there, but I'll bring it up, that I always confuse this film with a film called Scavenger Hunt that came out mm-hmm. apparently in 1979. And I always think, he always says, oh, it has my, uh, Midnight Madness had Michael J. Fox and Stephen First from Animal House, and I always go, well, it doesn't have Arnold Schwarzenegger in it because Arnold Schwarzenegger is in Scavenger Hunt and Stephen First is in that film as well. So that's why. <laughs> so his, I mean, he did Animal House, Scavenger Hunt, and then Midnight Madness. So, I mean, it was it was just a subtle variation for his career for a while. It's, it's amazing that he didn't go further. <laughs> I get the feeling that Stephen First, you know, Animal House was just probably, he, he lucked into that. And, uh, and then well, he real, he realized that, that he, I don't, I bet he never turned down any, any part just realizing this can't go on forever. Well, <laughs> I'm just, and, and, I, and really it, it has for him, you know, I think in animal house, he was cast just from that time where they're voting on the pledges where his picture shows up and everyone boos. <laughs> yeah. Like he has a great face in that. He makes the same face in, in midnight madness when his dad, when he tells his dad, look at me, what do you see when you look at me? And his dad gives him a, you know, a once over and, and Harold's sitting there with his hands in his pocket looking really pathetic. But what I like in this case is Harold is kind of the bad guy. He's the rich kid. And you have to just appreciate the 80s and the way they wanted to show off their kick-ass souped up uh, van with no windows, <laughs> the child molester van. Yeah. Yeah. And they yeah. just have a great one in this. It's, it's very A-team-esque with blue and the flames coming up yes. and all the bells and whistles i had they, i had a ma- i had a matchbox van that looked like that exactly. <laughs> it's probably it i it's think awesome. we all did probably it, yeah it was from and, the midnight uh, madness uh, matchbox <laughs> toy collection so and i love how they thought about computers yeah or how they just wrote the computer in this it could solve any riddle yes in, in less than i i forget what time he gives but you know less than like seven seconds or something like that and it is it does solve all these clues with that with that 16 ram <laughs> yes until he until he shoves the marshmallows in it and it melts yeah. right. which is another one i love when they're trying to repair the the computer and they just have all the uh the wires everywhere. I, you know, the thing about his his relationship with with his girlfriend, it, it seemed she seemed to be almost maternal with him. Not, and not just with the, you know, don't eat so much, but just just that relationship was it. it I actually when I was watching, I'm like, wait a second. Is this his girlfriend or is it like it's <laughs> his mother, his mom? <laughs> right. He looks way too young to be his mother. But. And, yeah, and you think of the entire thing that Emilio is just doing what he's doing to, to win over the love of his girlfriend. Yes. Uh, but Emilio, that whole group, Blade, Emilio, Harold, I just love their facial expressions, right? I forget the, the tall guy's name, the faggy beefy guy. Right. Uh, but he's just he's just awesome. He's just he, I mean, just his looks are, are just hilarious to me. <laughs> OK. Well, OK, so Patrick White, I I. I knew going in that no one, no one watching this film was going to love it or appreciate it as much as me, and that's fine, right? Yeah. Everyone has their own opinion. No, I get that. But what about this movie that that you have your reaction to, Patrick? What what do you when you watch it? Why do you say it's complete garbage? I, well, first of all, I'm not going to say it's complete garbage because there are good cast members in the cast. Don't get me wrong, but I, I looked at this and I'm being serious when I and sincere when I say. It's like a CBS TV movie of the week. I mean, it seems very low quality all the way around. But but it's less preachy. (laughs) TV movies always seem to have some sort of morals. Right. It's it's not preachy, but it's that this was a theatrical release because, you know, Disney didn't. I mean, they made some like crappy films in the 60s and 70s and stuff but you know they're they're coming out of like black hole the year before and they spent some money on that they you know a couple years later they're making tron and they spent some money on that and that the idea that they're trying to appeal to the animal house crowd to come and watch this film that this you told me that ahead of time and i don't get that at all from this this is not this is so dissimilar to animal house other than you have flounder in it that's about it and it was you you had all these actors but i never felt like they got room to do 
a lot or stretched because there was just so many of them. There was so, you know, you could have pared it down a little bit that the teams didn't need to be as big as they did. And, you know, you have Michael J. Fox. David Naughton is not, is not nothing at this time. I mean, you're about a year removed from him being an American werewolf in London. He'd already done his Dr. Pepper commercial. So he was famous. I mean, it was, and it just, everything just seemed to be like a cursory attempt at every, you know, like you said, like, why does the girl have so, so much interest in him? There's no reason for it. I mean, but she seemed like perfectly eighties leading woman, you know, she'll be on an episode of A Team next week. Type of girl, you know, she's right. Love boat, fantasy yeah, island. <laughs> that you know, I look at her and I went, God, I know I've seen her in something. And then I looked at her IMDb and I go, No, I didn't see her in anything. I and right. she, but she just looks like somebody that I've seen from some eighties television show or eighties, you know, low grade eighties movie that just she just has a look about her and nothing seemed to nothing seemed to stick i mean the i I, when i was watching it i was watching jason really loves this film and i kept thinking it's got to be because of the la connection but you know it's i I understand there's films that people love and you love this one and i I don't and there's nothing wrong with it it's there's there's you know films that you know i like the i like beastmaster from the 80s because i saw it a ton a ton and i always enjoyed watching it it was you know it was just a fun movie to watch it's total shit but it was a fun movie to watch yeah i mean this is really one of my all-time favorite films i know it sounds weird it's 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 just cheesy goodness to me it's right when people come over and we're gonna watch a movie at my house and one of my one of the questions i always always ask them is have you seen midnight madness if they haven't i'll turn it on and usually they don't love it Right. But they laugh at at points during it. And afterwards they go, man, that was that wasn't a great film. But they enjoyed sort of the adventure with it. It's probably because they're feeding off me because I'm you know, I like it so much and I get really excited about showing people this film who who've never seen it. Uh, So, yeah, a lot of my interest comes from one. It's not really well known, you know, but uh, Patrick, you brought up the Disney connection and I'm glad you did because. When you think about 1980, when this film came out, and you say, why does it just look so low budget? You look what you just uh, said in your run-up to it. The Black Hole, they spent a lot of money on, but it was a complete failure and disaster as far as profits go for Disney. Same with Tron. Yeah, right? Each, were, time, they... each time Disney thought that they were going to capitalize on the Star Wars, the real science fiction interest – science fiction adventure and both of them are were considered at the time failures i know tron sort of has a cult following and i'd probably be in that cult following as well because i always like the film even though i don't quite understand it but uh but i enjoyed it so at this point disney was in lots of trouble they were actually in financial trouble these were lean years for them because I, i think i think the last real you know big box office hit they had was probably the rescuers which was like what 1976 77 somewhere around there and, and yeah and i mean and they I mean, everything Heist after that with the company yet right right i mean they were they were going to be taken over uh broken up and sold off in parts yeah well they should have sold off this part real quickly so <laughs> I mean, you no, know, and, and no, that makes sense. The Disney today, you know, with its <laughs> Avengers Endgame and, you know, Star Wars films and uh, the uh, IP heaven that they have didn't exist back then at that point in time. And one of the reasons they went to PG was to kind of go for the dollars that they were missing because people weren't going to go see P- or G rated films anymore. That Well, that- their, their highest, I think their highest grossing film, you know, Greg brought up The Rescuers. It was actually like uh, Herbie the Love Bug. <laughs> right yeah. that smashed records for disney but they couldn't get a hit after that for the right, life they tried of right and they tried a bunch of sequels to yeah and, to and Her- this, the herbie you know, and here they and... tried to bring sort of a pg movie I, I mean i would be comfortable showing this to kids of any age even though it's pg there are some sexual suggestions there's a telescope at the Griffith Park Observatory where they focus in on a wound, a woman changing her clothes in the window. And then one of the clues is uh, look between the melons at Johnny's Fat Boy Burger. Those are the two big sexual references in the film. And that's 
I bet you that's why they got the PG rating. Um, but as I mean, when you compare a, a PG movie now to that, oh, yeah. PG, I mean, this is very. It would be on the upper ends of G rather than you know. A, it's a so benign, yeah. yeah. By today's standards, definitely. Right. What about Alrighty. what about Pee Wee? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I, and so they, yeah, they do have a lot of people in this film, um, and a lot of the faces you'll probably recognize from, like we said, a generic '80s TV shows or movies around that time. Uh, Paul Rubens wasn't even—I I don't even think known no. uh, for doing Pee Wee at this time, but he works in Pinball City. And and has a little cameo. So when you watch it later, you know, I saw it after Pee Wee already was Pee Wee. I mean, I saw this on HBO. Um, and remind me, I want to bring up why what times they played it on HBO, because it's a really odd uh, time slot. Uh, but Pee Wee was known by the time I saw this film. And so you go, oh, wow, that's Pee Wee Herman. But before that, you wouldn't know it was him. But it was I mean, it was a nice part for him to play. I thought he'd probably make one of the one of the nerds if he had, I guess, a better agent. But yeah, well, well, this this came out, and then the Blues Brothers came out a little bit later, but the same year. And of course, he had the little small part in that. And I think I think then his show started. Well, not not the series, but he started the Pee Wee Herman character about a year after that. Would, would he already been with Second City? Isn't that where he came from? I, I think so. Yeah, I okay. mean, because around the same time, he starts doing his little parts in the Cheech and Chong movies at the same right. time. Right, right. That, that, that too, exactly, yep. And But if you would reverse that, I don't know if Disney would hire someone associated with Cheech and Chong movies at that time. Mm-hmm. Now they wouldn't pretend they had no idea when he, <laughs> right. that he was in there. They would be like, what? We didn't know that. Um, but at that time, I don't think they would have had that crossover. All right. So I'm looking at Disney. The releases in 1980 uh, and their grosses. Uh, in December 1980, they have the reissue of the Aristocrats. Or sorry. Yeah, Aristocats. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Aristocrats, very big, diff- very different type of film. Uh, that gross is $18 million. <laughs> it's still small. For, oh, no, no, yeah. yeah, but but not but bad for a... Uh... A yep. re-release, right? Right. But remember the Disney. Uh, again, this is pre-VHS uh, tapes, pre-DVDs. So they would release everything every six years. So you still had Peter Pan making it to the theaters, Dumbo, right? Mm-hmm. All the Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, yeah. all those would make their rounds to the theaters. Yeah. But in, go ahead, Patrick. In October, the reissue of Song of the South. Uh, Nineteen point eight million dollars. What, what, what film? Patrick, Song of the I, South. I don't know. What, what is this film you talk about? I... <laughs> Probably one of the last times it was That's released. Whisk down the memory hole. Right. Okay, but on a side note, on a, on a side note, they built an attraction called Splash Mountain based on the Song of the South. Correct. They did. <laughs> and here, here's a little backstory of that. So when they were thinking about greenlighting it, Michael Eisner, who was head of uh, Disney at that time, was really afraid of the backlash. He didn't want to be any racist overtones uh, coming from that. So they re-released Song of the South in Harlem to see if anyone would protest it. And no one did. Yeah. And because of that, they went ahead and built the attraction. Yep. It's crazy. All right. July <laughs> – uh, here's a, here's an original film from 1980, The Last Flight of Noah's Ark with Elliot Gould. I saw that in the theater twice. Uh, that made 11 million dollars. The hey, on the on a side note, since we're all kind of familiar with some of the 80s movies that we watched on rainy days, did Disney do the one with Elliot Gould and Bill Cosby, where Bill Cosby was the devil? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. trying to Devil and Max Devlin. Yes, the Devil and Max Devlin. Yeah. Yes, okay. they did do that. Uh, in June, we have Herbie Goes Bananas making $17 million. In uh, May, we have Mary Poppins, the reissue of that, making $14 million. Uh, in March, we have the reissue of Lady and the Tramp making $26 million, biggest movie of the year so far. Wow. And then in February, we have Midnight Madness uh, making $2.9 million. So it is it is the lowest, but... Half the releases that year are reissues of films that they've just got to be just collecting money off of. Black Hole actually opened in December 
and that only a few months before that in 79 and made almost 36 million dollars but if you look even looking at uh like 1979 you know there's only three releases one of them's the reissue of 1000 and, or 101 dalmatians and then you got the apple dumpling gang rides <clears> again <throat> and the black hole so they they're not they're hurting the, yeah they're not pulling money they're not pulling really really big money although 35 million dollars in 1979 1980 money is a decent film it's uh, not necessarily if you spend as much as you did on black black hole but you're pulling 26 million dollars on lady and the tramp which is a film that had been released decades before you're that's just that's just gimme money at that point but but again keeping the company afloat i mean they were running into really hard times yeah so i i brought up uh the hbo connection that so i did see this movie on hbo for the first time the weird thing about this movie to me is hbo would only really run it late late at night so midnight, 1 a.m., 11 p.m. It was usually after the skin flick on Cinemax or HBO, <laughs> and then Midnight Madness uh, would come on. Sometimes, like, it, as a kid, if I saw it being on during the day, I would stay home from school and watch it. But this is uh, – it was on the HBO loop. It was just at really odd times. Yeah, I don't remember seeing this on HBO <clears throat> at all. But if it came on late at night, that probably would be why because I, I know that – you know HBO back in the day was very they would strict stick to a very strict rule that no R-rated films during the day uh, and so they would run those all at night and that's when they would run those in, like in their uh, circulation and you wouldn't see too many PG films late at night usually apparently except for this one yeah th this was one of the ones they would play late at night anything else you want to talk about Jason uh, no I mean I just encourage people to seek out the film and 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 watch it i i can't tell you how much i just want want to watch this film again <laughs> <laughs> but i i i mean as low budget as it is patrick you said that you think it had too many characters i think the characters are fine i like the teams um they're cookie cutters so they're easy to understand there's not a lot of development that happens between them but you don't need it because it's all about the adventure of the race and people do learn little lessons along the race but nothing preachy and at the end of the day it's just a, a really fun film you, you think it stands the test of time in in my book it does i mean if you ask me legitimately if you say jason i i need to get your 15 you know favorite films of all time even maybe the top 10 this would probably be one of them i understand wow. it's not going to be shown in film schools Right. If I was running a film class, I probably wouldn't teach anything that I learned from Midnight Madness. I don't think it stands up like that. But as far as just a cheesy, fun film that just brings joy to me, this is one of those films. Greg, do you think it stands the test of time? <clears throat> I think uh, that it. I enjoyed it. I think it's one of those enjoyable bad movies, cheesy movies. <laughs> And so and, and I think because of <clears throat> Michael J. Fox and even, you know, Stephen First, who's no longer with us, I, I think it's worthy uh, of seeing and, and thus stands the test of time. <laughs> All right. I, I have never seen it. As I said, I was confusing it with another film that I remember better and liked. But it's that's not the film that, that Jason had to watch. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but let me ask you this, Patrick. If yeah. You didn't hear me rave about this film, right? And think and going in thinking it's going to be great because there's right. times where people say you need to see this film. It's so great for you. The example I could do is like Forrest Gump, right? I imagine when you watch Forrest Gump and everyone told you how great it was and then you watch it and you say, what did you have one of those reactions because of the way I built it up? No. And I've always talked about. This no, film? I mean, I watched it for I mean, I've been doing this long enough now that I kind of come in with my own perspectives and I found it. I found I was really, really bored. I was it, it, the story didn't need too many characters, but even with the characters they had, the story didn't need to be as long as it as it did. And I, I ultimately I, I think it looks very, very dated. I think it looks very uh thrown together as i said it looks like a tv movie of the week and and it's it's got some good people in it it really does have some good people in it but it's like you you never let them fully off the leash 
to be as if you were looking for an animal house crowd to kind of appeal to that animal house crowd, but you're, you're, you know, poly it up so much trying to make it just so clean that it just, it's not quite there. Uh, so I, I, I you know, I, I, it was a chore for me to work through. It was just really, really hard to get me to, to work through it. Granted, I saw it the weekend. I, I saw Avengers end game. So there was, you know, there was, it was, it, it literally followed it that afternoon. So, uh, it was, it was not a, a film that I, I thought would, uh, it, w- it would stand the test of time, but I thought I would enjoy it a lot more considering who was in it because it's not, it's not a group of nobodies. There's some good people in it and even good character actors, uh, especially from the eighties. If we talked about uh, the guy from, I keep forgetting his name, but I think it's Wesley in the film, but uh, the, the nerdy guy who leads the nerd group is that it is, was Wesley in the film, but he's Eugene from yeah, Greece, from gr- yes. Greece. But I mean, he, he you know, he's, this is probably the most screen time I've ever seen him in a film. And I've seen him in both the Grease films in 1941. So it's, he, you know, he's a character actor that I think it can be pretty funny, even though he's kind of one note when I saw Paul Rubens and I went, Oh, okay. Paul Rubens is going to be in it. And they never really kind of got the best out of him either. And Michael J. Fox just plays a pissed off teenager the entire time that, you, you never really get his uh, charisma out of it. So yeah, I, I just don't think it stands the test of time. It's, it, it's not the w- worst film I've ever seen. Don't, I don't want to give that impression. It was, I'm glad I saw it, especially how many times you've raved about it over the years. It just, it was not. And, and I will continue to rave about and it. And you can do so that, and then you can do that. So last word on the subject is faggot beefy. <laughs> mm. All right, that does it for this week's review of Midnight Madness. Thanks again for joining us and listening to our little bi-weekly podcast. If you've had a good time, the fun doesn't have to stop here. You can follow us on Facebook at Lunchtime Movie Review or on Twitter at Lunchtime Movie. On either Facebook or Twitter, Twitter, you can keep up on our written film reviews, news on upcoming films and Blu-ray releases, and information on upcoming podcasts on the MHN Podcast Network. Additionally, you can now follow us on YouTube, where we're releasing our podcast day and date with their release on Stitcher and iTunes. Uh, and you can subscribe to our account and get the uh, updates to when they're being released as well as you can give us a like or a dislike if you don't like the film or our podcast well that does it for this episode of lunchtime movie review until next time i'm patrick i'm jason and i'm greg and we got to get out of here right now and you guys are invited podcast is intended for entertainment and information purposes only the theme music for lunchtime movie review fireworks is provided courtesy of alexander nakaranda at serpentsoundstudios.com under a creative commons attribution 4.0 license all original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of the mhn podcast network lunchtime movie review and fuzzy bunny slippers entertainment llc unless otherwise noted Starts to get to you, no matter what you do, you're gonna play.